Well, here to discuss some of the possible scenarios are Madalena Kay. She's an ambassador for the Young European Movement, which promotes the EU and its values. Andrew Lillico is executive director of the analysis firm Europe Economics. He says the Chequers deal has disintegrated, but a deal leaving Britain less closely aligned with Europe is still possible. And the Conservative MP Chris Philp, who is firmly behind both the Chequers deal and the Prime Minister. Um, Madalena Kay, what is your strategy now? I mean, you still think you can stop Brexit, don't you? Absolutely. Brexit can and should be stopped for the sake of our country, for the sake of my generation. Um, our futures are being taken away from us because um, the, the government's just destroying itself, trying to negotiate a deal with itself or a negotiating strategy. Before but how, how? I mean, how do you think this can be stopped? We have to stop it through a people's vote. That's the only responsible way to do it. To take... once we Another referendum? a people's vote on the Brexit deal when we know the facts. This is not a rerun of the, the first referendum. We want a deal when we have the information to make an informed decision. But why do you think MPs would deliver that? I mean, why would they agree to a people's vote when they're all saying they're against it? Because the reality of what Brexit is going to be is going to damage our country, our economy, our society, our culture. But you may and that's think not that. in the interest of the British I'm, people. I'm just wondering why you think Parliament, which has given no indication of being keen on a, a referendum on the, on the deal, is suddenly going to change its mind between now and March. What do you think is going to happen? I think the MPs are, uh, are scared to stand up for what's in the best interests of the British people. And I think as um, this Brexit shambles gets increasingly worse, I really think that they should act responsibly and give the people what they deserve, which is a final say on Brexit. Um, Andrew Lillico, I mean, you, you think the Chequers deal is dead, effectively? Well, the, I mean, Michel Barnier has rejected most of the key planks of it today in his uh, remarks. Uh, I, it's obviously uh, disintegrated internally. It would be very hard to get it through Parliament, I think, so I don't think it's really a goer. So where does that leave us? I mean, we've just seen all the sort of the, the grim scenarios laid out. Well, it leaves us with the um, most likely scenarios being uh, uh, either that we have no deal at all, so I think that's, that is a possibility, that, we're, that um, we end up with nothing. Uh, another, uh, more likely than that, though, is that they cobble together at the very last minute some kind of very minimal arrangement, uh, indication about the future partnership, just enough to, uh, to persuade uh, the Commons to pass the uh, a withdrawal agreement. So you get a transition deal and they still pay the European Union 40 billion euros. And I think that the very minimal deal on that would probably be something like uh, no tariffs on goods and we'll work out more things later. Um, the thing which w the focus should be on, though, now, is what was offered by the European uh, Union in March this year, which was the uh, Canada Plus deal. That's the arrangement that we should have been focusing on. That was the thing which was most consistent with Theresa May's Lancaster House speech, and that's the uh, thing that we should return our attention to now, after this <laughs> blind alley of the three baskets and uh, uh, managed by the was raising? and all that. You know, open skies, planes coming to a halt. I mean, do, you know, is that all easily solvable? Uh, well, if we end up with absolutely no deal at all, then, then, uh, then of course you would uh, probably expect there to be some very brief period of some sort of, of total disruption. Chaos. Uh, no, no, <laughs> total chaos. I know about total chaos. It would be a very brief period of um, uh, very considerable disruption if you were to go down that path. I don't think that that's very likely. As I say, I think it's more likely that they would agree um, some sort of deal which uh, persuaded the Commons to uh, pay the European Union 40 billion euros, because that's an awful lot of negotiating leverage in terms of coming to some kind of deal. Uh, and if they didn't do that, they'd probably come to the sort of deal which was indicated there, a no-deal deal, deal and a, of a few small things. But the focus ought to be on the thing which was offered by the European Union itself, a Canada Plus deal from March, which was entirely consistent with Theresa May's Lancaster House speech, uh, and which we should should return the focus to now after this Chris blind Phil, alley. I mean, a lot of the Brexiteers are saying this, you know, that, that this is all nonsense, we just need to go for a free trade deal and we can do that really quickly. Yeah, some people are saying that, but I think, having looked at the detail of Chequers, actually Chequers is better than the sort of arrangement Andrew was talking about. So, for example, on products, where we, we are saying, yes, we're going to follow, um, you know, product safety standards for, you know, lawn mowers and toasters and things, but that does mean that the aerospace industry and the automotive industry can continue their very complicated and integrated supply chains without disruption, and it completely fixes any hint of a problem over the Irish border. But it's dead, it isn't it? No, I don't think it is dead. It's not dead. So if you look at it from two perspectives, firstly, from the parliamentary perspective, we had a number of votes uh, last week and this week 
and with one exception, which was on the European Medicines Agency, the government won every single vote. Now, one of them only won by three votes. One I mean, only it, won I mean by it's six. dead because Europe will say no. Right, so I think from a parliamentary point of view, it's not dead. Now, from a European point of view, yes, we've heard Michel Barnier today making unhelpful noises, but of course, in a negotiation, you expect the other side, their first move is to throw their hands up with sort of a Gallic theatricality and say that the whole thing is unreasonable. I expect that as we go through this carefully, in the coming probably two or three months, that position will shift. And as Andrew said, um, they are asking us to pay a £39 billion divorce payment. That is a lot of negotiating leverage. And if he gets the sense that that may not be uh, forthcoming, I suspect his position may become a little bit more reasonable. But, I mean, you, you the, the government, seem to also want to talk up the dangers of no deal, that no deal is not as good as a deal. Um, you know, aren't you going to fall into the same sort of project fear, don't believe a word of it, they're trying to frighten you kind of trap um, that the Brexiteers want? Well, I think, look, I think the no-deal scenario is clearly it's really not a good one. It'll be um, disruptive. It's something that wouldn't serve our interests, and actually it wouldn't serve the European interests either. So I don't think we're going to end up in a no-deal scenario. If Europe does ultimately behave unreasonably and essentially refuses to accept checkers, I think that would be a mistake by Europe. But if they do... If they do that, then I think we're into looking at sort of very standard free trade agreements of the kind that Japan is about to sign, Canada has signed, which of course do keep aeroplanes flying and so on and so forth. So all this sort of catastrophe stuff, you know, hoard tins of beans um, is nonsense. But I think that what we're trying to achieve, the checkers approach, is a lot better. So let's try and deliver that. Do you, do you accept that the sort of the, the, the doomsday scenarios are, are nonsense? No, not at all. I mean, we need to look at the facts and we need to look at what the reality of Brexit's going to be. And, you know, the, it's, we've taken two years. We've wasted two years. There still is no plan. The government's still bickering over what there it is. There is a hundred page plan that was published last week, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, but like, how much time is being wasted on this? We're looking at transition periods or, you know, if we crash out without the deal, you know, is that what, 10 years of trying to negotiate little patchwork deals to fill in on? issues like the you know the aerospace and, and and medicines agencies and things why not just scrap but, it right now no, and try and well, start the are... real issues affecting the well country. the reason we wouldn't scrap it right now is because i'm a democrat look i voted remain by the way in the referendum and i in fact i campaigned to remain as well but i'm a democrat and 17.4 million people 52 percent of our fellow citizens voted to leave and we've got to respect their opinion and get on with it but on the point about you know will there be chaos look there are loads of countries where we have no free trade deal i mean the usa for example we have no free trade deal with the usa and yet we can import medicines from the USA, we import cars yeah, from the USA. It's false to claim All these that we operate, work. We, we, we operate on the U, with the USA on a WTO basis, because that's what we'd be crashing out on, right? There's, Not necessarily, no. There's Depends like over 100 extra agreements with the, with the USA um, that we trade on. Are you starting to get at all worried, though, about legitimacy? I mean, you know, we've now seen that vote leave broke the law. There is a police investigation. At what point do you get to, the, you know, to say... I'm not sure about this. Two years on, you know, what was it legitimate? Well, we're not going to get into the situation like we had in Ireland in the past, and I think in Holland as well, where the public sort of get, get, sort of get asked to vote again and no, again and again. but that's different. If you were just <laughs> asking people to vote again because you don't like it, that's one thing, and you could attack that. But this is a question of legality, you know, of, of, of whether it was actually legitimate. Well, I think it was legitimate. We had a very frank debate. But it was illegal. People, it wasn't, no, hang on. So one of the... It was illegal, the, that's what on, they've said. The, well, no one's, been, no, no one's been convicted of a criminal offence. That's what illegal means. The Electoral Commission have said the, they broke the law. Listen, I'm that's no, what illegal means. Listen, I'm no fan of, <laughs> of the Vote Leave campaign, OK? But they, they, what they found is that Vote Leave spent about half a million quid more than they should have done, OK? The government, of which I was a supporter at the time, spent £9 million, pounds, that's 18 times more, of taxpayers' money sticking pro-Remain information that to every door in the matter. country. It's about legitimacy, isn't it? That's why I'm asking. You're not worried about it at all, clearly. No, no, because 33 million people voted and the result was... It wasn't the result I voted for, but the result was quite clear. Actually, OK. I mean, does this worry you at all about whether the rules were adhered to? Well, it's better to adhere to the rules than not to adhere to the yeah, rules. But if and, they weren't people, adhered to, does it matter? I, this, I don't think anybody believes that that made a material difference to the result. But so nobody knows. It's, it's, it's just a guess, it's, isn't it? It's proper to pursue people who uh, violate the rules, but that doesn't mean that you believe that the actual uh, result produced is, is illegitimate. I don't think there's any question that, the, that we had a, an extended period of debate, a very full debate. It's gone on subsequently. Not only did we have the debate and the referendum, but we also then subsequently had a general election at which uh, more than 80% of voters went to parties who were committed to leaving the European Union we and leaving leave the customs there. union single market. So that's what we have to do. Andrew Lillico, Madalena Kay and Chris Phil, thank you all very much. Thank you.